All right, so chapter number six, we're going to do a, a high-level pass of management protocols, network telemetry, uh, which is basically logging, uh, timestamps, uh, network time protocol, and uh, also SNMP version three, and some of the other management components that we use to manage our network, uh, manage our devices, I should say. Uh, again, most of everything that we see in this particular chapter it's going to apply to my traditional iOS devices, like routers and switches, but some of this will apply to our ASA as well. This particular slide only applies to our traditional uh, Cisco iOS devices. You may or may not know, but your Cisco iOS files, there's really two critical files that exist in an iOS device. There's your operating system, which is stored in Flash, and there's your configuration, your startup config, which is stored in NVRAM, which happens to be a partition of Flash. But there are other types of protocols that exist. <coughs> Flash is like my static storage device. That's where I store my iOS image. That's where I store other system-related files that I need. If it's a voice router, for example, I will store things like uh, uh, firmware loads for a phone, uh, music on hold files, ringtones, etc. But basically just think of the flash as your hard drive. This can be upgraded. Uh, it can either be included internally or externally, uh, depending on the type of platform. The NVRAM, which happens to be a partition of flash, is really designed to only store one thing. Although it does store other things, it's really designed primarily to store your boot configuration what we call the startup-config. Uh, this doesn't exist by default, but as soon as you make configuration changes to the platform and you save those configuration changes by using the copy run start command, then you've created your startup config file. TFTP, the Trivial File Transfer Protocol, is the default transfer, uh, trans transport protocol for managing file systems on our device either copying files to the device or copying files from the device, we use the Trivial File Transfer Protocol. You can use FTP in some cases, not all iOS images support FTP, or you can use something called Secure, secure Copy. Both of these would require some basic configuration prior to the implementation, okay? But the file system in the device is used to store critical files and it's used to manage, you know, we use these different protocols to manage the, those critical files. Uh, the example of how a file might be stored in Flash, I would show you this in GNS3, but GNS3 doesn't actually have Flash. It's a virtual router. Uh, but you can see if I do a DIR, DIR flash colon or show flash, I can see the contents of the flash. In this case, this is a C2900 series image. Uh, it is a compressed image, executable binary image, and it's digitally signed. And this is the version in the mainline version, etc. I can use the TFTP to specify the location of an image and a TFTP server. TFTP is obviously the protocol in this case. The server location is the IP address of the server and the file that I'm trying to access is the file name. So obviously in our device, it's pretty critical to protect these two files, the configuration file and the iOS. Somebody could go into my device and type format flash uh, or delete flash and delete files and then I'd be kind of screwed because I wouldn't be able to run the device if the device was rebooted, I'd have to do an image recovery or I'd have to do a configuration recovery. So one of the uh, options that we have is to, of course, copy our files. In the first line here, we see a copy run start in what we call expanded notation. You don't actually have to type this. You could literally just type copy run start, and that would be sufficient. The router will then interpret that uh, syntax as the fully qualified syntax or the expanded notation which you see on the slide right here. System refers to DRAM. System refers to DRAM. 
uh, one of the tricks that you can use, for example, for an ASA. If I uh, go into an ASA, for example, let me see if I can show you guys this real quick. vpn.thinktankonline.labs Did I spell it right? I may not have SSH enabled on this guy. Uh, putty. Try it one more time. I may have spelled it wrong. Where did my window go? the heck there it is it was thinking all right so this is a uh, just an ASA uh, 5506 uh, you know standard basic ASA appliance uh, it's running version 9.6 software but uh, you know you can certainly do a show run, and you'll see the whole configuration of the ASA. This is actually our ASA for our um, data center for all of our um, pods for, for lab access. So we have a lot of voice and wireless net, uh, pods that we build for our classes and whatnot. Um, but you'll notice that uh, there are some things, if I can find one here, there are some things in this config that are hidden. Let me see if I can find an example of one. Probably don't have one actually now that I'm thinking about it because we don't have any site-to-site -site VPN tunnels. Um, let me see if I see any kind of redacted con part of the configuration. Mm -hmm. No, nope, we don't on this case. But anyway, it doesn't prevent me from showing you the trick. Usually when you're doing a show run on an ASA and you've got a bunch of VPN tunnels set up, one of the things that you're going to configure for those tunnels is something called a pre-shared key. Uh, unless you're doing RSA, you're typically going to use a pre-shared key for, for peer authentication. Problem is those pre-shared keys are redacted in the running config. They're just, they're listed as asterisks. All right, but you can do this. You can type more, more system colon running <clears throat> can't type running dash config when you use the more command it shows you all the passwords so you can actually capture that configuration with the passwords it's not going to show you username passwords it's not going to show you secret passwords but pre-shared keys are not really secret they're not they're not hashed so we I didn't have any to show you as an example but just wanted to show you that little trick because, uh, and, and, I, and I thought of it because they were mentioning system here in this particular case, but uh, this works on a router as well. If you've got a router that's running some sort of site-to-site -site VPN and you've got some pre-shared keys that you, you want to be able to discover or identify, you can use the more option to see that, okay? So I'm doing a copy. The copy command is always source to destination. You can use write mem to do the same thing, but from Cisco's perspective, the write command has been deprecated. Eventually, it'll be removed, but uh, uh, Cisco doesn't officially support the write command anymore. Uh, they want you to use the copy command. All right? Uh, in this particular case, copy run SCP. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Copy running config SCP. So clearly in this case, I'm actually taking my running config and I'm copying it to an SCP server. This is the actual URL for the server. This is the username, uh, or excuse me, username and password. And then this is the actual destination file name. So that's kind of the syntax for the SCP copy command. Here I'm taking a file from an SCP server and I'm making it my startup config. All right. One of the other things that's very important to understand is when you're making 
when you're copying files from somewhere to your running config. Whether it's copy TFTP run, whether it's copy start run, whether it's copy uh, uh, SCP run, whenever you're copying files to your running config, it always merges that configuration instead of replacing the configuration. So if I do a copy TFTP run, it's going to take the file from the TFTP server and it's going to merge it with the file on the device. Now, a lot of the stuff will be replaced because like an IP address on an interface, you can only have one. But if you have access lists that are different, it'll merge those access lists. There's a, it'll just cause a lot of problems. So we use the configure replace option if we're ever trying to change our running config. Configure replace means I'm literally trying to replace my config. And I can go into my device here, and I just type configure replace. And then I can actually choose many, many different options. Uh, I can copy it from boot flash. I can use HTTP, HTTPS. I can copy from NVRAM, which is my startup config. Uh, I'm not sure what PRAM is, but uh, sounds cool. Uh, SCP and so on, okay? This would, be, this would be a different way of doing it as opposed to like clearing the router and then having to delete VLAN files and all that mess? Well, this will not modify VLAN.dat, but yes, it would replace the running config. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to erase the startup, reboot the device, so you don't have a config and then paste the config back in. You can actually just do a configure replace and it will actually literally replace the configuration on your device. Okay? Uh, boot system command or pull it? Um. Uh, boot system, yeah, you can use boot system to identify what iOS. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really do a dir flash colon on this because no such device. Uh, this is a GNS3 router. Uh, I could potentially do it on here, although the ASA syntax is slightly different. This command works. So a dir flash colon shows you all the files that are stored in flash. You could potentially have multiple iOS images in your flash as well. Maybe you had an older image and you decided to upgrade, so you uploaded a newer image. Um, but which image is actually going to be loaded by default if you don't specify which image to use? First one in the list. First one in the list. <laughs> Not the latest one. Not the one you just, that's the newer one, just the first one in the list, which could be your older image. Okay? You can also see that there are directories here. So this is a log directory. This is a crypto archive directory. The D stands for directory. RWX stands for the permissions, right? As far as uh, what you can do against that folder, read, write, uh, delete, etc. When you go download images from Cisco.com, one of the things that you have available to you, it's not actually just MD5 anymore, they also do SHA as well, but you can go look at the file name that you're gonna download. There's a couple of things I wanna point out on this slide actually. Yes, we're looking at the hash. The hash is essentially a digital signature for that file. Uh, not that that hash can be, it's not a salted hash, so uh, it, can be, uh, it can be verified, it could even be modified uh, if somebody wants to download this file and then make changes to it and then publish a hash. But obviously because you're going to Cisco.com and it's an HTTPS connection, you've authenticated the source of the information. So this hash allows us to verify the integrity of the file. All right. The other thing I want to point out as well is whenever you go download any, any image, one of the things that you'll notice is that it specifies how much memory is required for that image to, to be stored and run. So the first number represents how much, I know it's really small on the screen there, but the first number represents how much working memory you need to run that image. The second number represents how much flash you need to store that image. So make sure that when you download an image, you meet those requirements. Because if you try to boot an image, Certainly, if you try to copy an image and there's not enough flash, that's easy enough to deal with. It's going to tell you there's not enough flash, and you have to delete the old file or make room or upgrade the flash. But the problem is, if, you, if you're trying to run an image and you don't have enough DRAM, 
it, uh, the device boots up, it starts extracting the, the image into memory. As soon as it maxes the memory, the, the device just reboots and it goes through the process over and over and over again. It keeps trying to load the image, uh, even though it knows that it can't load the image because it's not enough space. But All right. There is a command that you can actually use. I've never used it. I always use a third-party tool to verify the, uh, the um, hash. But you can use the command software authentic authenticity file. And then you can specify the actual image. And you can see all of the certificate information for that particular image, uh, what we call the digital signature. Okay. Uh, whenever you see an image that is SPA, in it. Any image that has SPA means it has this function. It's a signed image. Um, so usually I try to verify the signature of the image before I even put it on the device, but you can verify it once it's on the device itself. All right. All right. Another feature that is actually, uh, well, I would almost say is probably a best practice standard, is to use something called iOS image resiliency. Anybody heard of this before? Certainly questions on the test about it. Uh, it is such a simple thing to implement, but it protects against you know, some really, really basic problems. Right? It's actually literally two commands, secure boot image and secure boot config. That's it. Secure boot image and secure boot config. Let's talk about, oops, let's talk about boot image first. All right. First of all, to, to enable this feature, you have to be in privilege mode. But you can enable this feature from a remote connection, Telnet SSH. But to disable the feature, you have to be connected to the console. So somebody can't Telnet and SSH and just simply turn the feature off. What does this feature do? it locks the system so that you cannot delete the image from flash. You can format the flash, you can delete other files from the flash, but even if somebody goes into your router or switch and types format flash and it goes through the process of formatting the flash, your boot image doesn't get deleted. It's persistently stored in flash. Which means that even if somebody accidentally, accidentally, how I don't know how that would happen, formats the flash, you're still going to have a working operating system. Okay? And the nice thing about this is that you cannot disable that feature from remote connections. You have to be physically connected. Now, what's the opposite of that? What if you want to upgrade an image? You have to be connected to the console to turn that feature off first. Because you want to be able to upgrade the image, you want to install a new image. You want to use that image, but you probably need to delete the old image well, you won't be able to if the secure boot image command is set. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, so if it's running that, you put a new image on it and you reboot to that new image, will it automatically protect that new image? Negative. Uh, secure, secure boot image is executed at the time you run the command. It doesn't, it doesn't keep doing it every time you change the image or whatever. So it's secure boot image within the name of, you know, flash. No, just secure boot image. That's it. Whatever the active image is, is what becomes secure. So the image that you're running at the time you execute the command, that's the image that becomes persistent in memory. So it'll let you upgrade the image. You can still upgrade the image, but what I'm saying is in some cases you might not have enough memory to store both images in flash. So, so you, have to, you have to delete the old one so that you can put the new one on there. And in that case, you have to disable the secure boot image feature. Because, well, it can be. But you have to weigh that against being a pain in the ass of trying to recover a platform that doesn't have an image through Raman. That, that would be kind of pain in the ass, too, frankly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You have to do travel. Oh, I have to go to Belgium? Eh, all right, I guess. All right. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. All right, secures the running image. Image is maintained in Flash, but is no longer displayed in the directory of Flash. Cannot be deleted via the command line. This is another thing. I mean, this is not, I mean, it's not really that, it doesn't, it doesn't really hide the image. I can do a show version, and I'll see the image that's being used on the platform. But if I do a directory, I won't see the image file name. You know? But there are other ways to get the image file name without using a directory flash. Uh, secure boot config. At the time you execute the command, it copies the running config to a persistent storage location. So it's like a snapshot of your running config. Secure boot config does not, uh, and this one might be probably one that you would, would want to run if you're not going to run secure boot, and you can run these independently, by the way. Um, so every time you run secure boot config, it creates a persistent copy of your startup config in Flash. It does not protect the startup config from being deleted, but it makes it easier to recover if the startup config gets modified or deleted because you can actually restore this persistent copy into NVRAM. It's always there. So you're saying it doesn't keep it from being deleted from NVRAM? Correct. And then once you get your device back up, you can copy some flash back over. You can do a restore. It's not really a copy command, but you can do a restore of the persistent file that you saved in flash into your NVRAM. This one would be probably more useful for you guys, right? No. It only does it when you execute that command. You can execute that command as many times as you want. It doesn't create an additional copy. It just rewrites the new, it, re, it rewrites the, 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 over the same copy. So you, you have to execute, like the, the next line of the updated, like negating the command shell and reapplying, you have to negate it and then reapply it? Or can you reapply it on its own? Right. Well, yeah, exactly. So this is a bit of a problem with this, right? Because just like secure boot image, the only way you can neg negate secure boot config is from the console. Right. So I can't just go in there and do secure boot config, make changes to the boot config, and then do secure boot config. Correct. I have to Correct. You have to actually negate it first and then reapply it. Gotcha. All right. So, I mean, it's maybe not something that you do on a regular basis. But you have to consider this is like if somebody catastrophically destroys your flash, right? Uh, if somebody uh, formats the flash or, you know, if their intent is to uh, essentially uh, make your device unusable. You know, there are other ways to do recoveries. Obviously, if you're keeping backup configs, which are probably a little bit easier to manage through TFTP or some other automated backup process, which you guys are probably doing, that's going to be a little bit easier to manage than, than secure boot config. So that's how like, I was just going to play with it. Like this router I'm playing with is iOS 6 and you say. This is iOS, standard iOS. Yeah. They didn't incorporate this in the XE software. Yeah. I've got a CSR that's not on my Oh, OK. Yeah, iOS XE is, is pretty much where Cisco is going. Traditional iOS is probably not going to be around much longer. Well, I say that, but I really don't know. I mean, it could be around for 10 more years. But, uh, uh, but XE is pretty much where everything is going, right? The interface looks almost identical to standard iOS. Uh, but the way that the operating system works is a lot different. Uh, it, it works with these modules, and the modules get loaded separately. It's more of a modular operating system than a, than a, a, a standard operating system. Exactly, exactly. Runs a bunch of different daemons for different processes and whatnot. Show secure boot set. This will tell you uh, whether or not you have image resiliency activated. This is the secure image. Uh, and, and then we can also see the secure archive for the running config. There's the name of the secure archive uh, in flash run config. And then it has the time and date stamp 
uh, ARS archive file. Okay. What happens if I have to recover? Uh, well, it's very simple. You go into uh, global configuration mode, actually uh, uh, pri uh, pri global configuration mode, and you type secure boot dash config restore flash colon, and this is not the name of the file you're restoring from, this is the name of the file you're restoring to. So I'm saying go ahead and recover my config and put it in flash and call it archived config. You can call it whatever you want. In this case, they've decided to call it archived config. And then you do a configure replace, which replaces the running config with this archived config. So you don't even actually have to know what the file name is of that archived configuration, uh, because it doesn't really matter. You're just using the restore command. There's only one archived config in there. All right. Another very important uh, aspect of any, any uh, uh, router or switch or network device is the time. Why is time so important on different types of devices? Correlation. Event correlation if we're doing log analysis, right? But nowadays, it's actually even more important than that because we're doing all kinds of crazy things with security. We're doing time-based access control lists. We're doing certificates that have timestamps on them and lifetimes. Uh, so there's many, many different reasons why you would want to make sure that the network time is accurate on the device. Okay? NTP, which is the network time protocol, runs over UDP port 123, is a way for us to synchronize our date and time settings on the device. So Cisco IOSs can act as an NTP server. Now that's actually the default. All Cisco devices act as an NTP server by default. Uh, you used to have to type the command NTP master and then set the, set the stratum level. But uh, now, pretty much every Cisco IOS device is, is, will respond to time request. And then you can also specify a Cisco IOS device to act as a client and synchronize with an NTP server as well. NTP uses a hierarchy. That hierarchy is uh, uh, is uh, developed in the form of stratum numbers. Somebody explain to me how stratum number works, or the strati. Uh, well, it's 1 to 16, 1 is the best, 16 is the worst. Yep. Typically based on where the device is being timed from, which corresponds in relation to true or time. Yeah, well, there's a couple of different sources that you can get time from, GPS time source, atomic clock, cesium clock, whatever. But basically, the stratum number defines the trustworthiness of the time source. Uh, and a stratum, actually, zero is the lowest, but stratum zero would be the original time source, like an atomic clock or a cesium clock or some sort of GPS clock. If I get my time from that source, I become a stratum one. If he gets his time from me, he becomes a stratum two, and so on and so forth. Cisco recommends that you don't get time from anybody below four, right? At a minimum, you should be getting time from a, a level three or a stratum three device. Can you pull time from peers? Isn't there like a peer? You can pull time from peers as well. There's an NTP peer command. You don't have to just use the NTP server command. You can pull uh, time from peers. Uh, but that's the hierarchy they're talking about here is that different stratum level. You, you can't always trust that number, by the way, because you can actually set that number. If I want to become an NTP master, I can go into my router and say, I'm going to advertise myself as a stratum 3, or a stratum 2, or a stratum 1. Um, so that number is not always, can't always trust that. You can also implement NTP authentication. With NTP authentication, regardless of whether it's on a Cisco device or any other device, authentication is only done from the client to the server. In other words, the, the client is authenticating the server the server is never authenticating the client. All right? And that's done through the use of MD5 hashes or uh, different hashing methods. And we, we're not doing any kind of username and password type of authentication. We're using a standard MT, uh, NTP authentication process, which, by the way, is the same authentication process that we would use for things like routing protocols, other, uh, other uh, uh, 
uh, well, the, the shared secret key that we saw with TACX and, uh, and uh, TACX server. Same kind of concept. We have a secret key configured on the server. We have a secret key configured on the client or the other way around, doesn't really matter. The server sends out an NTP up, update. So this would definitely be the server in this case. That NTP update and the secret key go through the hashing function, which generates a MAC. MAC stands for message authentication code. Right? We generate the MAC. We send the MAC along with the NTP update in plain text. I receive the NTP update. I have my key. I run through the same process. And if the MAC that I have matches the MAC that was sent, then I know two things. Number one, this is coming from a trusted source. Because the only way that they could have generated a MAC effectively is if they had the right key. Number two, the message hasn't been modified in transit. The time message hasn't been modified in transit. This is how EIGRP authentication works. This is how OSPF authentication works. Uh, pretty much anything that uses a shared secret key, this is pretty much how it works. We're not doing confidentiality. We're doing message integrity and authentication. All right. Well, here's a whole config. Uh, I've got a couple things to point out here. This is not really necessary anymore, but that would be the command that you would enter if you wanted a router to be a time source. By default, that's pretty much enabled at, these point, uh, at this point. We're specifying where the NTP packets would be sourced from. Here, I'm specifying where I'm getting my NTP messages from. So this is the client and this is the server. Well, that's supposed to be an S. Server and the client. But here's the important part. NTP authentication key. They obviously entered the key in the, 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 the uh, well, I don't know if that's the encrypted version. I guess it's not really the encrypted version of the key. They just used uh, a very cryptic key there, but the key ID, which is 22. The key ID and the key string have to match on both sides. We never send the key string across the channel, but we do send the key ID across the channel. Uh, so when the server is sending out NTP messages, by the way, the client only authenticates the server. The server never authenticates the client. So if I'm sending my NTP updates out, I'm sending them with key ID 22. So when the client receives those messages, it needs to use key ID 22 to be able to authenticate those messages. So those, that key ID and the key string need to match. All right? And NTP authenticate is what enables the authentication process. If you're not running authentication, literally the only command that you have to run without the key is this command right here, just NTP server. You don't even have to put NTP master anymore. It's already there. All right. So syslog. Syslog uh, is a open standard format for facilitating the monitoring, auditing, logging of a device. You guys see syslog messages all the time. They kind of pop up whenever some sort of significant event occurs on the device. Uh, if that device is, quote, I mean, if that event is, quote, unquote, important, the service generates a syslog message, which usually gets displayed to the console. But syslog messages can also be uh, forwarded to a syslog server, or they can otherwise be stored in memory in the buffer, or uh, they can be written to flash or whatnot iOS devices, syslog messages automatically get sent to the console. But if you're accessing the device remotely through Telnet or through SSH, you need to type the terminal monitor command. Otherwise, you will not see those syslog messages show up on the screen. Uh, and uh, because we don't normally log to the terminal session by default. All right. 
Syslog messages also can be sent to a centralized repository, which would be either an external Syslog server, like a Kiwi Syslog server or something in SolarWinds or whatever. Um, and there are seven, or excuse me, eight different levels of severity within Syslog. Obviously, this is something that you're tested on. You need to know the numbers. Uh, the lower the number, the actual more severe the, the, the issue is. But the higher the number, the more detailed the syslog output is. So it's a little bit counterproductive or counterintuitive. Uh, zero basically means the system is unusable. But seven, logging level seven, is like a debug level, where you're actually going to capture everything about that device. Because if you're logging at level seven, you're going to capture everything at level seven and below uh, automatically. There's no way to capture an individual logging level without uh, capturing the rest of those levels, all right? Here are the different levels. Zero's emergencies, basically means the system is unusable. Level seven is debugging, meaning that you're trying to capture information about events that are occurring on the device, whether they're planned or not planned. Uh, debugging, typically you're trying to capture planned events. You're trying to identify specific functions that are occurring in real time on the device. Uh, and then you go down to informational, level six, notifications, level five, warnings, level four, errors, level three, critical, level two, alerts, level one, and emergencies, level zero. So I'll show you real quick. The ASA does logging as well. I don't have it open anymore, so let me go ahead and pop in there real quick. Uh, it does the logging actually directly to the uh, ASDM if you want to log to the ASDM. So when you go log into an ASA, for example, by the way, the ASDM software is actually integrated into the ASA. You can upgrade it, but it's stored on Flash and it's launched from the, from the ASD, ASA itself. Uh, but once you log into a device, one of the very first things that you're going to see is the, the home page, an ASA device anyway. You're going to see the home page, and then at the bottom, kind of the bottom half of that home page, you have your logging window. And you can see all of the different events that are occurring within an ASA. It's trying to do the fire, uh, fire site stuff or firepower stuff. We don't have that set up on this firewall. So as I go into my firewall for the first time, Actually, initially, logging to ASDM is turned off, so you wouldn't see anything in this screen, but very conveniently, there would be a button right here that says Enable Logging. And what you're actually seeing are different syslog events. You can see the severity level on the left. Every one of these events is a severity level of 6, which is informational, right? Uh, and then you can see the date and timestamp, the syslog ID, which is what we call the syslog facility, uh, well, so facility ID anyway. Uh, and then you see the detailed information. So these are just transactions that are occurring on this firewall, setting up TCP connections, tearing down TCP connections, and so on. You can also see this if you go under monitoring and you go into logging. You can specify the syslog levels here as well. So I can say, OK, I want to see all the errors and click view and if I did see errors in this particular case everything at errors and below would start showing up on this particular screen here all right you can see the the little graph on the bottom here emergencies alerts critical errors warnings notifications informational and debugging so obviously I'm not going to capture anything in that case because this firewall is yeah not really doing that much so I'm going to just click View on Debugging. So I'm seeing all those same level six messages. OK, there's one um, right here, error. All right. And it looks like in this particular case, there was a TCP session that was denied uh, coming from this address going to the outside address of the firewall. Uh, so somebody tried to open up an HTTP connection to the firewall. Uh, and the access control list denied that connection. All right. What's interesting about this is I can actually right-click that message 
and I can say, well, that's actually supposed to be allowed. I'm not going to do it, but I could right click the message and I can, I can come in here and then say, show the access rule that blocked this traffic. Or I could say, create an access rule, uh, which would out, allow me to actually create a, a, an access rule for that particular traffic. All right. I don't want to do that either, but uh, because I don't want that traffic coming into my firewall. Um, so there is, uh, you know, kind of some cool stuff you can do with the ASDM logging uh, screen, but you can create filters. You could say, okay, I want to filter by, um, you know, TCP or what, you know, you can build build different filters. You want to filter by severity. You want to look at a specific syslog ID, <laughs> source address, destination address, etc. So you could use this to troubleshoot VPN connectivity, uh, to troubleshoot site-to-site -site VPN communication, all kinds of wonderful things, right? I mean, traditionally, as a Cisco engineer, we try to like to avoid using GUIs. But in this particular case, ASDM is actually a pretty helpful interface. You can do all the same stuff in command line, though. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to use the ASDM logging feature to capture the syslog messages. You can send, send those syslog messages to uh, uh, like an external syslog server. So the severity level is what's going to indicate, uh, you know, the importance, I suppose, of the message, whether or not it needs to be handled or attended, attended to quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest of it's kind of informational. All right. To configure syslog in the command line, uh, there's only really a couple of things that you can do, actually three different things you can do. Number one, you can specify where you want logs to be sent to. Number two, you can specify what level you want to trap that information at. In other words, what logging level you want to use to trap the information. And number three, you can specify uh, the source address information if you want to maybe set up some access rules on your network to only allow syslog messages from a particular source so here in this particular case they said we're going to go ahead and log to the memory buffer uh, and logging buffered means go ahead and store that in my DRAM up to that size up to that amount of data number two I do not want to log to the console which is actually something we use quite often it gets kind of annoying if you're trying to do some configurations or whatnot on the console. Uh, I want to trap informational. That's the interesting thing. When you set up your trap, uh, your trap uh, command, you specify the logging level name. You don't specify the logging level number. But you could, you could specify the number if you wanted to. But in this particular case, they said informational, which means in this case, we're going to be logging level 6 and below. Level 7 provides the most amount of detail. Level 0 is the most critical type of events. All right. Why would I ever want to specify the source of my logging messages? In fact, why would I ever want to specify the source of any type of message generating from the router? Whether it's NTP, whether it's logging, whether it's... Uh, uh, well, any kind of message, SNMP messages, whatever. Well, okay. All right, then let me ask a secondary question. It's a SIG requirement. Why is it a SIG requirement? Why do you think it is? Because what do routers usually have that allows them to actually route? they have lots of interfaces. And those interfaces have lots of IP addresses, right? And there's a routing table, and we look at that routing table to make a decision on how packets are going to be routed across the network. What source address does a router use if it's generating packets to anywhere? If I have multiple IP addresses, what source address do I choose to use? The highest. The highest. Anybody else have an answer? How about the interface the packet goes out of? That's actually the right answer, right? 
whenever a router generates any kind of datagram, whether it's an EIGRP hello packet or a or a, a, a syslog message, depending on the destination, we might route it out of one interface or the other. But basically, the packet is generated, the, the packet is sourced from the exit interface, which could be completely random. I mean, not random, but it could change depending on how we're routing. Because So if we source our packets from the loopback, which is a virtual interface on the router, if we source our packets from the loopback, then those packets are consistent. They're always coming from the same address, regardless of whatever interface they leave from. Which means that we can set up a, a filter on our syslog server that says, only accept syslog messages from this IP address. Or only accept NTP messages from this IP address. Does that make sense? Now you know why it's a STIG requirement because it makes the network much more predictable and you can lock down these protocols to specific IPs, specific ports, etc. All right, logging host 10.10.10.60. Obviously that's gonna allow us to specify where the syslog messages are going to go to. Another option that you have, which actually kind of should be kind of a best practice standard, is to implement some sort of memory and CPU threshold monitoring. There is a whole slew of documents on Cisco's website that describe how to lock down your router so that you always have guaranteed resources available on that router and you get alerts and notifications when you hit those, uh, those different levels. Most people don't implement it though. And I'm guilty as well. We don't typically implement this in our customers' networks. Uh, you're getting a level of visibility that's usually not necessary. Unless you have routers that are, that are already kind of hitting their threshold or have the potential to hit their threshold, you never really get close to hitting those, those memory thresholds. You have two warning options for low memory conditions. You can reserve memory for all your critical notifications, like you know when a protocol fails or when something fails on the router, all your critical uh, syslog notifications. Or you can issue notifications when the memory flow falls below a specific threshold. So what we're saying in this case is, okay, if I say memory reserve critical, that will send me notifications once I hit a critical point on the router, where I don't have enough memory to process the everyday packets that the router is supposed to be processing in the switch. But at this time, you may already be beyond you know, repair you may already be beyond the point where you can actually recover the system. So you may decide instead to set a watermark. So in, let's say critical, I don't know what the actual values are, but let's say the critical level is 10%, right? You may decide that you wanna go ahead and set the, the low watermark at 20% or 30%. So you can be more proactive in trying to fix or resolve the problem prior to getting to that critical state, all right? Essentially what happens in this case is you just get a syslog message indicating when you've hit that threshold. Same thing with the CPU. Uh, if you do process CPU threshold, that'll define the different thresholds that you want to associate to the maximum CPU utilization concept. Uh, you can kind of see these values. If you go into your device, Let's go back to our GNS3 guy here and do a show memory. All right. And uh, this will tell you how much memory is used, how much memory is available, transit memory, processor memory, and so on. You can also do a show process. And the nice thing about the show process is it gives you a nice graph, if you will, of your CPU utilization over a period of time, over the last five seconds, over the last one minute, over the last five minutes, and then it will identify all the processes that are running on this platform, uh, you know, the runtime for that process, uh, the amount of stacks that were created to, to facilitate that process, and then it will also identify how much memory is being used by that particular process. And there are ways to sort this out you know, sort out this uh, this table so that you can identify what your what your uh, 
you know, most active processes are. Right? We can see here that this process is pretty active. This process here is pretty active. Uh, it's been invoked that many times. It's not really active too much from a CPU utilization standpoint. Uh, but uh, the runtime is how much, how many cycles this process is run. Uh, you know, and uh, you can actually sort the column, I believe. If we do a, uh, uh, memory sorted. So now you can see which one is using the most amount of memory, what the process ID is, and so on. I mean, if you're getting to this point where you're evaluating the memory at this point, uh, most likely you have some other serious problems. And we've run into situations. Uh, there are leaks in these devices sometimes, memory leaks, and, and certain applications or certain processes will continue to take up more and more memory until eventually the router is, or the switch is not going to run effectively. Uh, what's going to happen? How does that manifest itself? Control plane functions get affected. Data plane functions usually still work. Right, frame forwarding, it's not, those, those functions still tend to work, but the control plane functions stop working. Things like routing protocols stop working. Um, HSRP, VRRP, GLBP, things that require, require control plane processing stop functioning, uh, which can be bad. All right, NetFlow. You guys use NetFlow? NetFlow can be used for many, many different things, but it's primarily, it's built into Cisco IOS, and it's primarily allows us, it, it primarily allows us to identify different application flows that are occurring in the network. You know, these applications are running on the network. These are the typical sources. These are the typical destinations. This is the amount of memory, the amount of, of uh, bytes and packets that are being generated for these applications. Uh, and the nice thing about it is it generates this data into what we call flow groups. A flow group is basically a bunch of packets that are related to each other. <clears throat> packets, by default, are independent of one another. In other words, there's no sequencing. There are no acknowledgments. There's nothing to identify packet A belongs to pa uh, in the same flow as packet B or the same flow as packet C. But what the router is able to do is it's able to look at all the characteristics of these datagrams that are going across the network, and it classifies them into a flow of traffic. Very rarely are you just going to send one packet to be able to facilitate communication between two different clients. It's usually going to be hundreds of packets or maybe even thousands of packets to facilitate whatever it is you're trying to facilitate between those two clients. So it maintains flow information that allows us to recognize unusual traffic patterns. Maybe we see a spike in a particular application flow. Maybe we see a lot of different types of flows that are being created that don't normally exist. Uh, it allows us to do forensic analysis during an attack to identify the affected devices, how the data is passed through the network, and, and identifying how that, 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 that the application itself affects our, our, our data. Uh, and can also be used for other non-security reasons, maybe just for billing purposes, uh, for, for, for network use, bandwidth use, uh, all kinds of things. Yep, we can export uh, NetFlow data into SolarWinds. We have these things called NetFlow collectors that can collect all this information. Uh, Cisco used to have a module called the NAM, Network Analysis Module, which would take all of this NetFlow data and then you could build pretty graphs and kind of identify what was happening in the network. Now that's pretty much uh, rolled into uh, uh, the uh, VMware version of that, which is the network analysis software that we run on a VM. All right. How does the device, how does the Cisco router define flows? Like I said, it's basically based on common characteristics between each individual, individual datagram. Where, what was the source IP? What was the destination IP? What are the source and destination port numbers? What's the protocol that was being used? What was the toss byte set at the, the, for QoS? What interface did the traffic come in, at, in on? What interface is the traffic going out of? 
All right? Actually, we only really monitor the input interface. But by taking all of these different characteristics, source IP, destination IP, et cetera, we're able to identify that packet A is related to packet B, which is related to packet C, which is related to packet D. And then we can identify these flows. As you can see in the export packet field there, approximately 1,500 bytes, 20 to 50 different flow records can get created. Uh, actually, this number is very low now. We can do much more than that now. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we don't really get into the configuration of NetFlow in this class. Wish we did, but we don't. Um, but it's actually relatively straightforward. Right? You just enable the NetFlow feature on an interface. You specify where you want your NetFlow data to be sent so that you can capture that information and then make decisions based on that information. Another important, by the way, that uh, when you ever hear the term network telemetry, that's what we're talking about when we talk about NetFlow. Network telemetry is anything that allows us to capture relevant information about what's happening on the network. <clears throat> Management protocols, SSH, preferred over Telnet, check, you guys understand why. Obviously, HTTPS is preferred over HTTP. Again, you understand why, because uh, it's in the STIG, right? No, I'm kidding. You actually understand why, because of uh, confidentiality, encryption, and so on. SNMPv3, same reason. SNMPv3 is the first version of SNMP that provided us the ability to do things like authentication and encryption. What did I do prior to SNMPv3? How did I authenticate users that way? Public and right, community strings. Right, we use public and private community strings, which is like a shared secret password. Public community string, that's what allowed us to do the read-only stuff. Private community string allowed us to do the read-write uh, and, uh, and, and you know, we'd be able to push information to a device as well as pull information from a device. So, how do I set up a router to support HTTPS over HTTP? HTTP is enabled by default, so we can go ahead and turn that off by doing the no IP HTTP server command and enter the IP, IP, IP HTTP secure server command. In order to be able to run secure server, we need to be able to support 443 which, of course, is going to use either SSL or TLS, which requires the use of uh, cryptographic keys, private and public key pairs. So we probably will also have to generate a certificate pair on the router. We do the crypto key generate RSA for that, which we would have already done for SSH anyway, but we also need to do it for HTTPS. You guys probably don't use either, huh? Use HTTPS? Right. Right. You do have a certificate-based authentication, right, to gain access to devices and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, SNMP v3. Uh, it is a, well, first of all, it's the simple network management protocol. It's a UDP-based application. There are three different versions, version one, version two, and version three, but uh, if you are going to run SNMP, version three would be the version to choose. It uh, uses these tree structures called management information bases. Management information bases. Uh, it is a, basically a, a tree that you're allowed, that the agent, the SNMP agent walks through to be able to gather information about the device or to set information on a device. Every device has its own MIB or multiple MIBs. Potentially, you could have multiple MIBs. The MIBs are built into the operating system. You can usually update them or upload new MIBs if you're, if you're upgrading the software or whatnot that would be included. But the management information base is like a tree structure that identifies all the characteristics of that particular device interface statistics uh, or interface components, CPU components, memory components, 
just about everything. Okay. So SNMP can either get information by pulling these uh, information elements within the management information base, or it can set information in those information elements within the management information base. We can also send out unsolicited notifications via trap messages and inform operations. There is a difference between the two. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But essentially, we're sending out information about the, uh, the device itself, unsolicited information. A trap message is typically like something that you would generate if you had an error or some sort of event occurred on the device. So it would trigger some sort of trap notification. SNMP version 3, as we just mentioned, replaces the community string properties with a user-based security model. And there are three modes of operation. There is privacy, which includes encryption. There is authentication. There is authentication in combination with privacy. And we always will have data integrity built into it as well. Kind of the three cornerstones of security. Who are you? I'm going to make sure your data is hidden. And I'm also going to make sure your data is not being modified. All right. The three security options are no auth, auth, and priv. Keeping in mind that the two operations that are optional are authentication and encryption, message integrity is kind of integral to any SNMP message that goes back and forth. Which one of these things do you think is going to provide no authentication and no encryption? No auth. Which one's going to provide authentication without encryption? Auth. Which one's going to provide both authentication and encryption? Priv. OK. And you can see that here in this command, SNMP server group, NMS group v3, priv means that for this version or this group, this SNMP group, we're going to run authentication and encryption. So what is the engine ID? The engine ID is just a unique identifier to identify this particular device. We've got SNMP server NMS view. And what we're specifying here, essentially, I think they actually have the details on the, no, they don't have the details on there. We're specifying the, the management information view record or view information. So we're going to allow both of these views uh, through SNMP. This, this last command is really what kind of ties everything together. SNMP server user, NMS user. So that's the user that we're using to authenticate SNMP traffic. The NMS group, which kind of ties all of, well, sorry, wrong computer, ties all this stuff together right here. The view and the user get tied together. Uh, we're saying we're going to go ahead and run authentication. We're going to use SHA for message integrity. We're going to specify our authentication password. Auth pass would be actually replaced with the password. Privilege uh, means we're going to do encryption and authentication. We're going to use AES encryption. And then we would specify our privilege password. So this is actually not the entire configuration. There's a couple of things that need to be replaced here. But certainly a lot more complicated than doing SNMP version 1 or version 2. And then this is the host. This is what ties the user, which we created here, the group, which we created here, the view, which we created here. All of that stuff gets tied together here. And then we're saying, OK, we're going to use 
all of that information to communicate to that SNMP server. And by the way, we're going we're gonna to authenticate to that SNMP server using the NMS user account, NMS-user account. All right. Access control list. We had a previous lesson where we talked about access control lists. We kind of already kind of already demonstrated this concept, but you create an access list globally, whether it's a numbered access list or whether it's a named access list. In this particular case, our goal is to filter who can actually SSH or Telnet to that interface. Who's allowed to SSH or Telnet to that interface? Uh, we see, uh, well, the first part there, access class 99N. We've applied this to our VTY lines 0 through 4. So who's allowed to actually access our VTY lines through a remote protocol? Those guys. Anybody that comes from the 172.16.99 subnet? and host 172.16.50.50. You can do the same thing with HTTPS access. I know it doesn't say HTTPS here, but when you're applying an access class to HTTP, that would apply to both HTTPS and HTTP. So you don't actually have to specifically say HTTPS in this case. What if I want to apply access, uh, access rules to SNMP? Pretty much do the same thing with my group command, right? So that was the previous command that we saw right here. The only difference is I just added or applied access list 99 to that process. And I also applied it to the uh, user authentication or basically my SNMP v3 policy. The 99 at the end applies access list 99 to this as well. This wouldn't affect SNMP traffic leaving the device. This would affect who can connect to this device for, for get requests or set requests to the device itself. You guys, uh, how do you secure access to your VTY lines? You obviously use AAA, right? You're doing some sort of AAA. And you also apply an access class to the V2I line as well? Yeah. Multiple layers of defense. That's what we do. Secure passwords. Don't use enable password. Why not? It's not recommended. You don't need it. Uh, well, we don't use it because they're not encrypted. Right? Yes, because they use, believe it or not, a basic substitution cipher that was invented by the French in World War II. So the fact that it was invented in World War II and the fact that it was invented by the French makes it very insecure. No offense to anybody that's French, but uh, yeah. I'm joking, of course. But it is, uh, uh, with a basic substitution cipher, what are we doing? We're just taking certain characters and replacing them with other characters. What do you need to know in order to, to uh, decrypt a substitution cipher? You need to know the S box, the substitution box, right? Which is basically your key. There was a show I was watching uh, on Netflix called Turn. I don't know if anybody here has watched it before. It's about Washington spies and, uh, you know, it's a very, very interesting show, but they, they, uh, they talk a lot about all the techniques and whatnot that were used, uh, you know, by the colonials to, to to pass information and share information with each other to fight the British and, and the occupation and whatnot. Uh, it was uh, it's very interesting, very very interesting. But they do use a lot of those techniques, right? So they'll write out a letter, and they'll have a sheet of paper with holes cut in it, and then all you have to do is put the piece of paper on top of the letter, and it shows all the characters that you're supposed to read. Kind of like a substitution cipher, not quite, huh? Yeah, Con Air and yeah. 
all kinds of crazy stuff. So a couple of things that you can do uh, to protect, I, I suppose you could do this, service password encryption. That's supposed to encrypt, quote unquote, encrypt all of your plain text passwords. But I think anybody that knows anything about Cisco knows that that's not actually true. Uh, yes, technically it is encryption, but you can go to any web page and decrypt that information very quickly. It's, uh, it's primarily used to protect against shoulder surfing, right? So you don't want somebody walking by and seeing your password. But if somebody gets a hold of your running config, yeah. Yeah, right there. Yeah. So service password encryption, even though it is a service that you should technically run, you know, you try to avoid using the password option as much as possible. Uh, enable secret, a little bit different. Secret means the passwords are going to be hashed using an MD5 hash. And in fact, they're hashed using a salted hash. All right. I was, uh, somebody told me, be careful when you go down to Stafford because I heard a story the other day about these two peanuts. They were walking down the street. One was assaulted. <laughs> anyway, you don't get my joke? Yeah. Um, yeah, MD5 hash. So that means if you enter the password over and over again, or you enter the command over and over again, every single time that hash is going to change. You can always tell it's an MD5 hash. Well, there's two ways. Number one, the five. And number two, MD5 hashes start with string one string on Cisco device. So the first three characters of a hash uh, always start with string one string. You still want to make sure that you're using secure passwords. Uh, pass phrases are probably your best option these days. Uh, people are still hung up on the concept of using a lot of different characters. Uh, but the length of the password tends to be more important than the complexity of the password. Uh, when, it, when you're talking about work factor and trying to identify how long it's going to take to break a password, let me show you guys something real quick. Um, and uh, this will help demonstrate this concept. So I'll go out to the little Google here. There's something uh, called the password haystack. Uh, and there's a, a, a couple of folks that uh, came up with this little cool website that describes uh, the work factor that's required to break a password uh, based on operations per second. And you'd be surprised that complexity plays far less of a role than length does. All right, so I'll do a quick uh, password Haystack. Well, I mean, certainly depth matters, right? right? If you're just using lowercase alphabetical alphabet characters, then you only have two to the power of 26 combinations. Then you use uppercase and lowercase. Now, all of a sudden, you're using uh, 52 different combinations and so on. So it will make a difference. But let's say that I say my password is password. All right? 26 characters. Uh, search, space, search space length is only eight characters. So that means that it's going to take me about, if I do an online attack, 1,000 guesses per second, about 6.91 years to guess that password. Now, this does not take into account the strength of the password. Like it's not, we're not taking into account any kind of dictionary attack or, you know, where you're actually guessing words or whatnot. We're just basically basing this on the, the search space itself. All right. Offline attack, maybe 100 billion guesses per second, about two seconds. And if I have a massive cracking array, I think that should be, that should be the name of a band. Anyway, uh, 100 trillion guesses per second, obviously you can see. But if I just change one character, well, because I changed it to a number, that now increased my search space by 10 characters. Still the same length of the password, 
maybe added some randomization, now it went from nine years to 92 years. Again, not taking into account the simplicity of the password. But uh, if I had a password of 11111 dot 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 exclamation point, even though this is not really a random password, because we're using numbers, symbols, uh, and actually I could even do an AA in here, numbers, symbols, and letters, 54 million centuries to crack this password, right? Uh, or 2.83 weeks for a massive cracking array. So this wouldn't necessarily be considered secure. But what if I just use a passphrase? This is my password. Please don't come in. Now, you could probably remember that very easily. Obviously, it's very long. Our, our search space depth didn't really change much. Only 59 possible characters because I only used, uh, well, essentially I used just ASCII characters, right? I didn't even use any numbers. Uh, 41 characters in length, but look at the actual search space size. 4.10 times 10 to the power of 72. Even with a massive cracking array, 13, point, or 13 trillion, 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 trillion centuries to crack that password. That would take a while, right? So, but we don't have any uppercase. We don't have any digits. It's just that, which is why passphrases are generally considered to be more secure than anything because of the length. Um, and but you know everybody is still kind of hung up on this idea that. You have to have uppercase, lowercase, has to be 16 characters. You have to have, uh, you know, you can't repeat characters. You can't have any common names or whatever. Those are all good things. And yes, they will result in a secure password. But if I put the standard password that I use, Z4HK8 Akume, I won't say the whole thing, but if I put that in there, it would actually take less time. And I'm using numbers, characters, uppercase, lowercase for that password. Um, what's the general policy that you guys follow these days? I, like 16 characters? One-time passwords? That's what it's turned out to be because I forget and then you can't ever read the last one. <laughs> like, yeah, becomes one-time passwords. Well, you know, passwords will eventually become kind of a thing of the past anyway. We're going to be using biometrics or, you know, some <laughs> sort of other authentication method, but. Do they allow you to use passphrases? Probably not, huh? It's hard to use a passphrase when the biggest you can use is 16 or 16. Well, it's hard to use a passphrase if they make you have all the special characters, too, right? If they make you say uppercase, lowercase, numbers, et cetera. I guess you could, though. You could say, my birthday is April 10th, comma, and I'm awesome, exclamation point, or something like that. I don't know. You could do something like that. but. So uh, yeah, I mean, um, I still haven't really gotten into the, the habit of using passphrases for passwords, but spaces are allowed in Cisco passwords. Spaces are allowed, so you could use uh, Cisco passwords. We still see a lot of customers today, though, that are doing thing like, things like, I have one customer called, uh, we'll just say, we'll make it up here, they're called, they're called Storm, all right? So they're using a password like ST0RM exclamation point, right? It's obviously not very secure. Um, and that'd be something that somebody would probably guess at some point or another. Mute all. Oh. All right. You can actually tell the router what the minimum password length is for the router. I can come into the router and I can say, you're, when you set passwords, they have to be this long. All right? That would, be, that would assume that you're actually doing some sort of local authentication on the device. The, the security passwords would also apply to the enable secret password. What about no service password recovery? Ooh. That sounds like a good thing to do. What is service password recovery? What does it allow you to do? What does service password recovery allow you to do? 
You can reboot a device, break the boot sequence, go into ROMMON mode, change the configuration register to bypass the startup config, reboot the device again, it loads the iOS, goes into a, a regular router configuration mode because it bypassed the startup config, and then you can uh, go to privilege mode, copy the startup config to the running config, change all the passwords, and you've now reset the passwords on the device. That's what Service Password Recovery allows you to do. It allows you to break the boot sequence and then change config registers and do all kinds of stuff. Okay? If you type no Service Password Recovery, it still allows you to break the boot sequence, but when you break the boot sequence, it erases the contents of the NVRAM. Probably not something you want to turn on, right? Yeah. But uh, what you're you're, you're kind of like, ah, if somebody is well. First of all, the only way to break, the only way to break the boot sequence is if you're physically connected to the device, right? Through uh, through the console port. So you're already assuming or at least hoping that the person can't get to the console port because it's locked in a room or whatever. I was in a hotel one time and uh, the internet wasn't working. And so I'm walking by, uh, and I see the guy sitting there. Uh, he looked rather lost. Uh, he, he was a contractor that came in from whoever was supporting that hotel. And he was hooked up to the router, and he didn't know. He was, I heard him on the phone, and I heard him saying something like, I need to get the passwords. I can't do anything without the passwords. Um, so I said, hey, man, you need some help? And uh, we broke, uh, rebooted the device. It wasn't working anyway. Rebooted the device, broke the boot sequence. In five, in three minutes, we were in the device and already had the config. And and then I helped him fix it. And then that was that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, I fixed many a hotel's wireless. I was doing it. I probably shouldn't say this on the video. A week. Anyway, that's the story. All right. Um, never let a security class come into your hotel if you're not being secure. All right. Banner messages. I know you guys use these, right? Of course, banner messages uh, required, right? And what, what do we typically want to see in a banner message? Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to my router. If you need anything, let me know. I'm be more than happy to help. Uh, yeah, or or something like, uh, this is the most important router in my network. Please don't do anything to it. Right? Um, no. Obviously, banner messages need to include some sort of legalese, warnings. You know, you're being monitored, etc. Uh, Russians stay out, kind of deal. But. Uh, uh, obviously, for you guys, for the military, it's a lot different, right? You guys have very specific guidelines on how banners are supposed to be created and, and uh, published. But in the uh, private sector, you know, you're really trying to protect yourself against theft of information. Not, a banner doesn't actually protect you against that, but at least allows you some legal recourse if it occurs. Uh, so if you have verbiage in your banner that says welcome or Anything that could be interpreted as you're allowed to come in, then whoever breaks into your system, that if you sue them or you take them to court for criminal prosecution or whatever, they can say, well, it said welcome. I thought I was allowed to go in. I think there was actually a case where that happened, um, where uh, somebody was broke into some bank or something like that, and, uh, and they got caught, but because the banner said something like, Welcome to Bank of America or something like that. The guy said, well, I thought I was allowed to, to go into that system, right? Yeah. I thought I was allowed to take all that money out. Uh, no, I don't think you did anything like that. But So you got different kinds of banners. you got a banner that can be displayed when you log in. You've got what we call the message of the day banner, which is what most people use, because that's a banner that gets displayed every single time you access the system, regardless of the condition. Every time you go into the system, you get the banner message of the day banner. You can have a banner that gets executed whenever you go into exec mode. Uh, so if you tell that, this is the message of the day. Once you're logging in, there's your login banner. Uh, actually, when you go into privilege mode, there's your login banner or your exec banner. 
and so on. The message of the day banner wasn't really intended initially to be kind of your standard banner. It was supposed to be a banner that displays, like if you're going to do maintenance on a system, or if you're, it's supposed to be an internal banner that gets displayed to indicate that maybe something is happening with this device or whatever. But it's pretty much kind of been developed as or, or adopted to just being a regular banner. All right. So that's the end of that chapter. We'll just go ahead and keep moving forward. We're going to start to get into some pretty interesting stuff.